Okay, I've cleaned up the Peter Meter doc, and you'll be able to download this. It's a little hard to read right now, but I don't want you looking at the text. Just look at these numbers. I've now made it a little clearer what they are. The paragraph, when it's divisible by seven, which is the convention that the Bible writers have followed since Moses, when the paragraph's divisible by seven, I've marked it here. So you can see, because they're telling you important historical, future historical information when they do that. Each of these numbers has a significance that was established in the meter of Psalm 90. Sorry about all the noise. Okay. Anyway, 84 was established by Moses to mean the decree of God. It's, it's subsuming all um, of time from beginning to end. And it includes 14 years for the, the temple rebuilding, first temple being rebuilt into the second, going over time versus the allotment that Israel had. At the same time, that allotment was okay because Moses had matured 54 years early, not Moses, but Abraham, had matured 54 years prior to the year 2100 from Adam's fall. And that was the allotment for maturation before Israel had to get started. The Jews call that first 2100 years, but they call it 2000 years. They call it the Age of Desolation, and you can Google on that. They're wrong about the amount of time, but they're, they're right about the meaning, essential meaning. The second 2100 years, they call the Age of Torah, and that was supposed to be the Age of the Jews, established by Abraham. He had until 2100 to mature, but Noah's... Uh, time grant ran out 54 years early, so Abraham had to mature early. That's why the story of Abraham is so important in the Bible. And he managed to do it. He super matured just in time. That was his age, 99. That's why he was going to have Isaac. The super maturation schedule is illustrated beginning in Genesis 5 with births of sons. That's how you learn about it. When you crunch the numbers, you find out about this doctrine I've been talking about all this time. It starts in Genesis 5. I made videos on it starting in my Genesis with Exegesis video starting in episode 8C1. That's where you see the, the schedule, the timeline. I did a whole worksheet using just the Bible's dates so you can see that what I'm talking about is an actual doctrine in the Bible starting in Genesis 5. Well, by the time you got to Abraham he had he Noah's time grant for 490 years was running out, so he had to mature by age 99. But it was 54 years prior to the end of 2100, so there was a time credit of 54 years. 14 of them got used up by reconstructing the temple over its regular allotment. So that's what the 140 is signifying, and that's what all Israel knew the 140 meant. That's why Peter's using it here. All right, Paul uses it also. Daniel had used it. Isaiah has used it. Isaiah in particular used it in Isaiah 53. You'll have to see my Psalm 90 playlist to see the Isaiah usage because that's what really tells you, you know, anybody reading this in Peter would know exactly what he's talking about when he says 140 because of the use in Isaiah. All right, so he's tying back to it. He's tying back to Psalm 90. He's tying back to Isaiah here and Psalm 90 because Psalm 90 uses the 140 also. And so the idea was 14 years got used up. There's 40 years left. The temple was supposed to die 40 years after Christ died. And he was supposed to die 37 AD, but he died in 30 AD. So they were expecting the temple to go down any day because the rapture was, you know, all bets are off. But still, if God followed the old timeline, then the temple would go down 70 AD. So that's why Peter's writing. And in his parlance, because he might be using Roman AUC system, it would be 66 AD by what we call 68 AD, because we got a two-year variance with the Roman AUC system. Okay, so that's why we got to say 68 AD, but by Roman AUC terms, and it depends on which Roman AUC calendar you're using, that makes it even more complicated. It would be 66 AD. That's the same convention Paul follows. So Peter is tagging to Paul, and 
he's letting you know what year he writes, which is 66 AD, which we have to convert to 68. That's the year he writes. This is his dateline. He's following the exact same convention, exact same number of syllables as Moses, except in his convention, it's 84 years after Herod started rebuilding the temple, and it's 84 sevens after the second temple started to be rebuilt in Haggai too. All right, that the 84 is 84 in years and 84 in sevens, 84 sevens, okay? And anybody reading Peter would know this immediately because they counted syllables. That was their indexing system. They didn't have Dewey Decimal System. They didn't have chapter and verse. They had syllables. And every Roman and other historian of ancient times you want to mention understands that people counted syllables, that they even made lines in the old days. But in the very, very oldest of days, they just counted syllables because they memorized the material. They didn't carry around big, heavy scrolls or parchments. So they just memorized it. it was more convenient. People were very literate, but they were, you know, they didn't want to carry around huge documents. All right? So this is how they did it. So cumulative, so we got the paragraph here, divisible by seven, and these numbers are all very meaningful doctrinally, okay? Then you got the conversion into AD following Paul's system that Peter's using, and then you have your cumulative total of syllables equals years, but it, you gotta know what the beginning date is, and in Peter, it's 18 BC, all right? He's, he's He's saying he's writing 84 years after 18 BC. So this accumulation is tying to Paul's numbers, but it's also, you know, it's a sort of bridge between 66 AD when he writes and 84 to tie to Paul. It's very complicated. And this wasn't complicated to the people reading it at the time because they were raised on this system. It was easy for them, very easy for them. Mary just says the system right off the top of her head in the Magnificat, you know, just spontaneously. When Daniel's praying in Daniel 9, he uses the same system, and, and he's just praying out of his mouth, you know, standing in front of a window. So this was all old hat to these people. This was like their ABCs, all right? It's a pity we don't know that today. So I'm trying to show how it works, and then, you know, after I'm dead, maybe before, but probably after. Somebody else will pick up the ball, someone authoritative, and run with this. That's why I'm doing this. Until I die, that's what I'm supposed to do. Okay, so your first thing is your paragraph numbers are divisible by seven here. Each one tells you something about that time period. All right? And Paul used the same convention even as all the other Bible writers used. Okay, the cumulative number is tying to Paul specifically, tying to Paul's syllables, all right? And it, here, and this is what confused me, he's going beyond Paul's syllables here, but here he ties to Daniel, because this is where Daniel leaves off, 483. Okay, Daniel leaves off at two places, 434 and 483. You have to read the Daniel document to, to, to understand that, because Daniel's metric system is very, very complicated because Daniel's basically quoting and tying back to the books of Kings and Chronicles while he talks and he's doing his accounting in his head at the same time. That's why he was ruling Babylon. Okay, so the trick here is to figure out why is Peter doing what he's doing, when he's doing it. All right, just the overview. So just look at the numbers. All right, what Peter's basically saying is that we're at 66 A.D. here, 122 A.D. here, in order to tie to Paul. Okay, but he's also tying to Paul here. So this period in between, say here 122 to 140 A.D., is a time bridge to overlap to tell you how to read the verses in Paul. And as you've started to see now, I've started to document how Peter's verse interleaves with Paul's verse in order to create a marching song. All right? And the marching song continues all the way through 1 Peter 1.12. All right? And I haven't gotten that far in the videos posted, but I will. Because I have to show how the whole song works in order to get in detail how Peter's verses here in 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12 interleave with Paul. 
and then we'll understand more about why he benchmarks the time. But here I want to show you just generic meaning of these benchmarks so that, you know, between now and the time I finish posting the videos, if you do your own homework or if I die, you can figure out what the heck's going on and save yourself some time. I don't know if you're supposed to do that, but somebody is. So in case you're the somebody, let me just say what I know now as much as I can. Okay, 84, tie to Psalm 90. 84 is the date line, as I've already said. 56 is the direct reference to Paul. You've got the exact quote in blue here so that you know where to benchmark. He's benchmarking the same time period as Paul, starting where Paul does. But when Paul is writing, he's that's his date line is 56 AD, R58. Okay, so why is Peter overlapping it? Because basically this takes you to 122 AD. And the only reason I can think of so far is that is that he's providing either an update or more information on the same time period versus what Paul did. In other words, it's prophetical. He's going ahead of his own writing date. Because he's going to die soon and he knows that when he writes. All right, he knows he's going to die. These are deathbed letters of Peter. They're written within a couple of months of each other, maybe even a couple of weeks. All right. So deathbed letters are, are supposed to be more important than normal. And so he's giving you prophecy. That was the tradition ever since Genesis 49 with Jacob. When you're dying, you give a prophecy about the people. That's what he's doing here. And, of course, Christendom knows nothing about this because they don't know anything about meter. They're still debating whether Hebrew even has meter. Well, but they didn't count syllables like the ancients did, so that's why they can't detect it. And they're looking for Western ideas of strophe and, you know, troche and all that stuff, which does apply in Greek. But Peter's not using that meter. He's using Bible meter. And that's why they can't detect it. Okay, so between 66 and 122 AD, what you're supposed to understand from this meter is that the number 56 means it's a critical time in history. It's likely to fail. All right? The rapture is likely to come, however, because it's a 56. It's so high. All right? It's, it's higher. If it's a 28 or a 56, it means, yes, growth is going on, but it needs to be like a 70 in order to say success. And there's no 70 here. Okay? It's a 56. So between 122 and 140, AD is a critical time in history, so it's really from 66 to 140 is the most critical time in history, and it's not good. I mean, it's better than it's going to get. It's going to get even worse after this, but it's not good because it's a 56. 56 is the number of years between the number of days between Passover and Pentecost, between Pentecost and Ninth Ave in the Hebrew calendar. The Hebrews don't keep their calendar right today, so they don't remember this. They don't know this. It's it's 57 days between the first day of Passover and Pentecost because pa Passover, the 50-day countdown, which the Jews today call counting of the Omer, that doesn't start until piggybacked on the last day of Passover. Numbers 28, 26 tells you that. But the Jews aren't reading the Bible right, so they don't know that. Sorry I have to keep on, you know, taking all these side trips, but there are a lot of mistakes being made by scholars, and I just have to tell you what they are, and then you vet them. That's all I can do. All right, so basically the whole period from 66 to 140 is extremely critical. It's not going to turn out well, but it's going to turn out better than later history. All right? So then his next stop is 63, which means there's actually some progress. There's a very terrible period between 140 and 203, really terrible period, that results in 63. They almost get there. It's almost ready to rapture, but not quite. Okay? And Paul explains why, and I did a lot of detail on the, that period historically. So you're going to have to read Paul to understand more about what this is. Peter's expecting you to know the Pauline verses when he does this. Okay? So they come really close by 203, and that's just before El, um, Severin dies, the emperor, okay, the emperor of Rome before he dies. That's just when the so-called church fathers, specifically Irenaeus, 
are getting started and church is really going into the tank really badly okay Aurelius dies in 185 or 186 okay so between Aurelius and the end of the severance because um, Severin is going to die the first Severin is going to die in 205 so that's why this period is benchmarked okay and that's when you know the, the whole church father thing really gets going and that's just the beginning just at the, the end of this thing during this period is when the first term Catholic becomes used and that's the the so-called the Bishop at Rome okay is being promulgated to the Severan women to the mothers okay to try and sell them on um, going into Catholicism what was just then becoming Catholicism they actually invent Catholicism during this period to try to convert the Severan women and you can find that out oddly enough in a book called Bishop's Lists by Robert Williams I did reviews on that book I had had permission to, to even show some of that book from the publisher and that book is um, reviewed in my popemyth.htm playlist I want to say it's beginning around the 13th video in that list okay so that's why Peter's benchmarking it and Paul had benchmarked it too all right so to 231 from 213 which is when actually they started trying to convert the severance historically and that's what that book will help you understand um, until 231 um, when the crisis of the third century began in earnest um, that's when Origen was there Julius Africanus was there Hippolytus was there and Demetrius of Alexandria was trying to compete with Origen and that's why they invented the very first time Peter on a Pope list okay and that's what that book um, Bishop's Lists by Stephen Williams which was originally his dissertation um, that's what that book demonstrates from actual church document records at the time it's real embarrassing okay all right and that's what Paul was predicting and that's what Peter's playing on here the rise of apostate church see church didn't really institutionalize until this period here and that provoked the crisis of the third century because when church goes into its own civil war which is what happened that's when all history goes into a civil war that's why you need to know this meter that's why Peter's documenting it here it's all prophetic all right and Rome really goes into its own civil war here because Alexander Severin the late the last of the Severin emperors gets murdered in 235 231 persecution of the church begins because of all the machinations that were going on between Hippolytus, Julius Africanus, Origen and Demetrius of Alexandria with the Severans. They get thrown out of court. Hippolytus gets banished and the so-called Bishop of Rome gets executed and there's a persecution that begins of Christians because of their trying to unite church and state which of course is Revelation 17. Okay, but Revelation hadn't been written yet when Peter's writing this. John's revelation is partly based on Peter. And if I live long enough, I'll show you how. Okay, so that period, there is a lot of growth partly due to the persecution. Okay, there is a lot of growth, but not enough. So they're just shy of making it for the, you know, tribulation. They could have, the church could have matured here, despite all the Catholic, the beginning of what they call Catholic today which wasn't called Catholic back then, beginning with all that apostasy. They could have still matured despite those apostate people. But once you get here, it's a 28 baby. That's half of 56. That's nowhere near enough. But there is still growth. 28 is better than 21, is better than 14, is better than 7. Okay? See, the higher the number, the more maturation is occurring. God's full maturation plan is 84 plus 7 is 91. And that's why Paul balances to 91s. I know this is a lot of information, but I'm trying to get all this into one video. Okay? And I know you have to squint at the screen, but you can print this document out if you want. Okay, the next big period historically is between 28 and 259 AD. I mean, 241 to 259 AD, which really, I guess you really want to say 231, starting back here, to 259 AD. So Peter benchmarks it again. Now he's tracking to Paul 
241, therefore, to 259 is a get out of Dodge window. All right? That he's also tracking because this is 241 AD, this is 259 AD, and this, this latter number balances to Paul. Because Paul's saying AD also. So he's, Peter's creating a little window here like Daniel did when Daniel did his own bifurcated timeline. All right? And that ended up being the time when, you know, everybody and his brother wanted to be an emperor, and there were 16 different emperors sometimes, okay, during this period, which the Roman historians today call the crisis of the third century. It was a nasty time to be alive, but in a way, it was a great time for Christians to grow because the power base was not centralized. And because it wasn't centralized, you could escape from one emperor to another. Say one emperor was anti-Christian, the next one would be pro-Christian for political reasons to try to cater to Christians. Okay, so you moved around a lot. All right, and this was a basic window for moving around. All right, and then again, you get another window between 255 and 273. Now, during this time, there's a little bit of consolidation in the Roman Empire. During this time, the Christians are fighting each other cat and dog. This is when, you know, the, there's so much civil war in Christianity that, you know, people are choosing sides. And, of course, you see that if you read Paul and you found out a little bit about the history of what was going on during that time. It was a terrible time to be a Christian. Really terrible. Okay, in fact... It was so terrible, but Peter benchmarks this period in particular from 259 to 273 as a double crisis period. Now, Paul had benchmarked the period at a 14 ending with 252, which was the Decian persecution. And what Peter is doing is he's overlapping that by two years because there was a guy named Gallienus who inherited the, the Western Roman Empire, and he was friendly to Christians. So you, your 14-year period in Paul, which ended at 252, ended up getting a little boost, okay? And I'm not 100% sure, you know, in what way Peter's modifying Paul's scheduling. See, because this is dynamic. You can't predict historical trends anymore. You, uh, how do you want to call it? They're fluid. The historical trends are fluid. It's not time-based prophecy like it was in the Old Testament. Church is determining history, and that's the whole point. Paul's meter was, what if the rapture occurs in 84, you know, 122, 140, and then he tells you what the character of the time would be if the rapture had occurred or if it didn't occur. Peter's updating that because Peter's writing 10 years later, and the church's maturation has changed. So now all the probabilities high, this is what you can know about history, because there are timeline effects. If you mature today, there's a ripple effect in the future. That's what Peter's trying to communicate here. See, sorry, he's updating what Paul says, because there's a ripple effect during the last 10 years of how people have been maturing in Christ versus when Paul wrote. Paul's now dead. That's one of the big ripple effects. Paul is dead. So there's a blessing of time going out to Christianity because Paul died victorious. That was 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. And so Peter's sort of plotting that along with like revised what-if scenarios of the rapture. Okay, so that's why he's overlapping Paul. It makes some difference because now it's 255 instead of 252 in Paul. Paul had charted 14 years ending in syllable equals year 252 AD. So it's like there's an extra three years that get to go on for the crisis period. So now you got till 273 instead of 260 on your outside window. 260 was Paul's outside window um, in Ephesians 1 11. All right, so it, it, you're seeing the fluidity, you're seeing the effect of time, of maturation on time in, in an updated timeline. Okay, you can't predict the rapture because you can't predict your own growth, much less anyone else's. But on a, on a global scale, these numbers are provided so that you can get a sense of the importance of maturation for you or anybody else. And you don't know when it's going to happen still. But you got some sense of when it's most likely. All right? Because you have to plan your life. All right? So that's what these things are doing is telling you how to plan your life. Okay? And basically what Paul says is after 337 AD, all bets are off. 
because maturation is so low. So what we want to do is see, well, now that Paul's dead and it's 10 years later, did that forecast in Paul change? And that's what I'm looking at here. So Peter's tracking 273. That's 273 in Paul. And then he gets to 350 in Paul. And that's where Paul breaks off. He literally broke off at 343. Okay, so there's an extra seven years, and notice how he's saying 77. So somewhere, this is just this is when Constantine is in office at this point. Okay, he he at 313, um, what call it? Galerius dies, and that's when uh, Constantine really starts to consolidate his power. Okay, by 330 he's built New Rome, and and 313 also, 323, 13, 323 period, that's when the whole institutionalization of the Roman Catholic Church actually begins. Okay? 312 was, I believe, the, the Edict of Milan. Might have been 313. I'm talking off the top of my head, okay? And the other guy that, that he was, that Constantine was fighting ends up getting defeated between the period 312 to 330. That's when New Rome gets built, called today Byzantium. And then during this period is when Constantine dies, and, he, and that's at Ephesians 1.12, Proel, a Proel Picotas, and that's a slur on Constantine. But in terms of overall Christian growth, between 273, okay, and 350, Peter's telling you that there was a great deal of growth, okay, but it didn't, what, it was... In, during this period, because this is during the Diocletian persecution, okay, Diocletian comes to power during this period right here, okay, because of the persecution there was a lot of growth, okay, but notice it's 77, not 84, 84 is God's purpose realized, and then you just play out the tribulation, but it's shy of that, see it's, the, the total is supposed to be 91, when God's plan is altogether complete and everything's been played out, it's supposed to be a 91. Okay, but it's 14 shy of that here. So the tribulation still doesn't occur. But in a way, for its own period, more than, you know, enough growth occurred to make up for all these past deficiencies. So you got a 28 instead of, instead, you got a 14 instead, you got 28 instead, you got a 63 instead. These, these should each be 70s. But they're not, because the growth didn't occur properly, all right? But this sort of, this extra seven here sort of makes up for it, all right? So what that means is that the persecution between Diocletian and then, and then later under Constantine, because Constantine persecuted both Christians and Jews, during this period, that's when Constantine's sons kill each other over whether God is one or three. And he's saying that due to all those persecutions, there ends up being a lot of growth in church. Why? Because people are leaving. They're growing up or they're leaving. They're leaving the Roman Empire and they're taking their Bibles with them to get freedom. And this is what's so important about this. 350 is where Moses stopped in Psalm 90. 350 syllables equals 350 years. He made a, he made a 350 syllable you know, time poem. Psalm 90, that's what it is. Peter is tying back to Moses there. And that's really significant because when Moses ended Psalm 90, he ended it with a 14-year cliffhanger. And that's exactly what Peter's doing with his 77. It's supposed to be 91 if God's full purpose was realized. We'd all have been raptured at that point then. And history would have ended. Well, but it won't be. Okay? 84 doesn't even get realized. We're 14 short of 91. 7 short of 84. At 84, that means tribulation, rapture should have happened. Tribulation should begin, rapture should happen. That's the idea. Forecast ever since Moses. When Moses ended Psalm 90 in verses 16 and 17 of Psalm 90, okay, he's leaving a 14-year cliffhanger there. And Peter's doing the same thing. Because his cliffhanger was, he was predicting the, the future temple. He was predicting the demise of the first future temple. And he was depicting when he says, Get, let us establish the work of our hands. And he says it twice. That's for two sevens. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. He's saying that, the, you know, Jerusalem and the temple will not be complete at that point. So establish the work of our hands, meaning we got some building to do. Very clever. Okay. 
So the 14-year cliffhanger makes him end his, his psalm at 350 syllables. Now, think about this. It can't be too hard. 350 plus what? 140 is what? 490, which is the basic time grant. See, that's why Israel had 140 years left on the clock at the time Moses wrote. But by the time Peter's writing, she used up her 14 years. And that's why she's in overtime. And that's why we got a 14-year shortage here, versus 91. I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you, but like I said, I don't know if I'm going to die. Okay, I have no reason to suspect I'm going to die. It's just that I don't think it's fair that I know this information when I'm just a brain out. Why don't the scholars know this? And the only reason I know is because I asked God. So there's a certain amount of, I don't know, fear. I'm not sure if it's the sin of fear, okay? But I'm like afraid that what if I die and this information dies with me and I shouldn't really worry about that. But maybe I'm supposed to worry about that. See, I can't tell if it's a sin of fear in my head or God warning me, hurry up and say this. Okay, see, just because I know this doesn't mean I'm a good person. Doesn't mean I'm a spiritual giant. God has a sense of humor. That's what it means. Okay, 350, end of Psalm 90. 77, 14 short. Okay, so now all of a sudden Peter stops tracking to Paul. He shifts onto interior lines. That's a military term. And I don't know if he's like playing on Daniel, because this is what Daniel did also. Daniel goes back to his own time on the interior timeline. Peter seems to be doing the same thing here. Paul stops his time poem at 434, Daniel's 62nd week, which is really the 69th week. And Peter's adding some kind of postscript here from 434 where Paul's meter ends in Ephesians 1, 14 to tie back to Daniel because this is where Daniel's meter ends in Daniel 9 um, when he's finishing verse 19 verse, yeah, verse 19 okay, and then he, he uh, Peter's also tying to God when God gives a meter to reply back to Daniel in Daniel 9, 24 through 27 and Daniel 9, 26 of course is really 483 years the 69th week so Peter's hanging, doing his own cliffhanger, except it's seven years, not 14, because what Peter's telling you is the temple will be down. Okay, so seven years is only left on the clock. All right, but he ends it like Paul had done when Paul covered the last meter. Okay, Paul used the 49. Okay, and Peter's saying 49. 49 is worse than... 56. 49 is the number of years that that um, Israel had um, to wait before she could rebuild the temple. Okay, the total of 70 years was not the total number of years she was out of the land. She was out of the land because she missed her Sabbaths. This number of Sabbaths that she missed was the equivalent of 49 years. Okay, seven. Um, yeah, 49. 49. And so, because she missed those years, and I documented all that in mirroring.htm, because she missed those years, she had to go into diaspora. What Peter's telling you here, just like Paul had done, is that church is so bad that it's like being in diaspora. It's analogous to Israel's time between temples, which means that Israel is under total discipline by God. Okay, church is under total discipline by God beginning, and this happens to be, the rise of Odovacher when he was 15, okay, between then and really technically there, thereafter, and he's illustrating that. Now, I can tell you more about this when I've done the inner leaving, but I just wanted you to get a heads up on the sort of overall meaning of these two pages, and I'm sorry you had to squint to look at the screen, but I wanted you to see all in one page so you can see that Peter's very organized here. And any scholar who tells you that Peter's Greek was no good, they didn't know how to read Peter. I'm sorry. This is perfectly meter Greek. It's not Greek meter, it's Bible Hebrew meter in Greek words. So Peter knew Greek very well. Anyway, that's it for now. Sorry I talked so fast. Signing off.